So we're, we're doing Seneca's of Anger, and this is a, I guess it's not technically an essay, it's actually a letter, um, quite a long letter. I've, uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, that was one thing I was going to look up and, and I didn't, but do you, do you know anything about kind of these letters? I'm guessing there was only one copy of it. So, I, so I don't know anything about the, the history of, uh, on anger specifically. I know a little bit about some of his other stuff. Um, and I know a little bit about Seneca's life here and there. Um, I, by no means am I an expert, but um, I would imagine somewhere in the context of his life where this letter lands, like, you know, he, he wrote other essays and things and like, he's famous for his uh, moral letters to his friend Lucilius, wh- which he wrote, I think while he was in exile. Cause he, he, yeah. uh, he was exiled and, and being a stoic, like took that as an opportunity, <laughs> uh, to do some philosophy um, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure where this lands in that timeline. Yeah. I mean, a lot of writers would like, you, you know, they would welcome that. They'd be like, oh, this is great. You yeah. Know, nobody can bother me. I can just write all day. I mean, you know, not being able to see any of your friends and family, that's kind of sucks, but yeah, but yeah, the, the writing time, but yeah, no, I was just curious. Cause like, you know, it's almost a hundred pages long, so pretty pretty bulky letter and i would i would feel like if i was the person receiving the letter like i would feel this giant responsibility of like wow this person just wrote me a masterpiece and like i have the only yeah. copy yeah um cool i i really i really dug the piece i mean it uh he's a very kind of he's very methodical in his approach to writing which was kind of refreshing i I'd, I'd we'd done a Montaigne and Emerson in the last two and they're kind of both they're both great but they're very all over the place Seneca is very much just like here is my argument here I'm going to define my terms I'm going to answer these questions it was very just like yeah I mean like if he was writing like a, a paper for like a undergraduate essay or something like he would he would have gotten an A for just how organized it was yeah, and you know the funny thing is, of the the Stoics, uh, he's not even the most straightforward. Really, uh, he's uh, at least I would consider him more on the flowery side. Um, like among you know Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, um, Epictetus, and even like um, you know Musonius Rufus, and I'm um, anyway. Yeah, he's a little bit on the flowery side compared to the rest of them. Yeah. Well, it's probably not coincidence that the Stoics are very, um, you know, organized in their, their thought. Uh, it would be weird if somebody like Emerson, like wrote like Seneca, but said the things that Emerson said, and it would be weird Mm. if like Seneca was saying Emerson's sentiments in a very like structured formulatic way. It would just, (laughs) it would just read very weird. But, um, But yeah, anyway, so he he starts the the letter by kind of defining his terms a little bit by kind of saying what he means what he means by anger. And right. uh maybe I can read some some definitions here. So he says Yeah, go for it. For Sir Seneca, anger is the desire to avenge an injury, which is similar to Aristotle's definition which is the desire to re- repay suffering. Um, and he takes a bit of time to distinguish anger from just like an impulse. He yep. sees anger as like a, a rational function as, um, I, I think he even says something along the lines of, um, he calls it a crime of the mind. And he, he even says here that, uh, in his view, non-human animals are not able to experience anger because it requires uh, rationality in order to experience this. And what what something like a dog or a cat or a, you know, a really pissed off cham- chimpanzee is experiencing in, in Seneca's view is more of just a, an impulse that just kind of comes out and uh, and goes away just as quickly. He says there that like, 
an animal basically is not able to hold a grudge like a human. Like if you piss off an animal, like they'll forget about it pretty quickly and they'll be able to sleep soundly throughout the night. I think he says, uh, which is different from a human. The human has that vengeance, has that need for justice and to kind of, um, you know, avenge the wrongs that were done to him or her. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, did you have any any thoughts on kind of just his definition and how he thinks about anger? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely resonates with me. Uh, this is part of the reason that I, I picked this um, this essay for us to do together or why I suggested it. Yeah. Um, you know, this also falls in line with a lot of the thought from like modern mindfulness and um, I guess the modern psychology. Um, you know, if you pay close enough attention to really most strong emotions, but anger in particular, and, and he also, which is really cool, he takes the time to uh, outline why anger is distinguished from the other passions, um, mm -hmm. you know, like lust and greed and, and the rest. Um, if you pay close attention to anger in like, especially if you've trained in some mindfulness practice, so you've got a, a really, especially acute uh, way of paying attention to things. You'll notice that that initial impulse, like say somebody cuts you off in traffic, that initial impulse that feels like anger actually doesn't last very long. Like mm. it's gone in a matter of seconds. And if you watch what your mind is doing, what your thoughts are doing in those moments, if you like, if you were to, if you think that your anger is persisting longer than those moments, what you'll notice is that you're actually reminding yourself, you're replaying a story in your mind of mm. why you're justified in being angry. Um, and you know, you could, you could take a picture of the situation, you know, 10 minutes before and 10 minutes after some incident that incites you to anger and not see anything different in the situation other than the fact that you're angry. So from an outside view, like the justification for being bent out of shape in that moment may not even still be there, but because you are able to replay this story in your mind about why you're justified in, in having this feeling, the feeling persists. And that's just a habit that we, most people are in. Like it, I'm not, uh, by no means am I judging this habit as like, uh, you know, some sort of special moral failing for having it. Like that's, that's just the way that people tend to be, whether that's nature or nurture. Um, but it is a fact about yeah. human psychology that in order to, in, in order for anger to persist, you have to manufacture it. You have to re manufacture it after the initial impulse. Um, and I think having seen that from a first person perspective and then reading, uh, you know, things like this, like it, it all kind of resonates experientially. Um, and it seems to resonate from a scientific perspective, as far as I can tell. Um, so it, it's really cool to see that, you know, Seneca from, you know, however many thousand years ago, uh, also had that insight, you know, among, among others. Totally. Well, yeah, I liked a few things that you said, you, you said, um, you called it a story. This, this story when somebody cuts us off in traffic. Uh, because I think story implies that we are kind of adding some kind of narrative. And the narrative may or may not be true. So it, it rarely is, you know, the thing that pisses us off when somebody cuts us off in traffic isn't that we had to, like, hit our brake and that caused us some kind of, like, you know, it was a real pain in my ass to, to hit the brake pedal. No, the thing that pisses us off is... We have this story of, oh, this person cut in front of me because they don't respect me. And, you know, it, it, it's, we start to make it into like a personal thing, which we'll mm -hmm. probably get into later. He has a whole, whole bit about how we tend to over personalize uh, these kind of injustices that are done to us. Um, yeah. And then the other thing you were talking about is, yeah, I was doing a little bit of uh, research on on Seneca and you know his influence today, and I thought it was really cool to to see that a lot of um, like rational, emotive, what is it, re 
I'm, I'm butchering it. Oh, Al- rational emotive behavioral therapy. Yeah. RBT? Yeah. Our, uh, Albert Ellis was, was pretty big into Seneca and the Stoics. And then later on cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, was influenced by that and, and the Stoics and yeah. And they, they, those guys all kind of read a lot of this and you can see some of the, um, you know, cause I'm not sure if it's, uh, I think it's cognitive behavioral therapy that talks about cognitive distortions and a lot of these cognitive distortions are, are kind of things that Seneca, you know, lists in this letter. Mm-hmm. He doesn't, he doesn't give them that kind of formal formulaic name. Like in CBT, they would say, um, okay, your mind reading, like that's a kind of cognitive distortion where, you know, I kind of like we, what we said, I, I, uh, you, you know, you make a face and then I make up a narrative of what that means. Oh, he yep. looked up into the side. That means he thinks I'm an idiot. So mm-hmm. that's mind reading. Um, so yes, I, I thought it was cool to just kind of see some of these cognitive distortions. Um, yeah, I could, to kind of trace back that thought and see a lot of that in here. Yeah. Um, uh, continuing on that, that, idea of sort of the impulse versus the continued response afterward. Something that I found interesting in my own journey with anger, uh, was the feeling of like discomfort with cutting off anger in a way that feels like quote too soon. Mm. Right. So let's say something, something drives me to be angry. That impulse arises then there's a pattern that sort of feels like a natural rise and fall of anger. And it takes a certain amount of time. But if you start employing some strategy to, to cut off that rise to sort of nip it in the bud and deflate it really, really quickly, like that can feel kind of uncomfortable. It can feel kind of unnatural because it's different than that normal flow. And, uh, for me at least, like that was one of the big challenges when I started working. So when I was a, when I was a little kid, I actually had pretty bad anger issues. And when I started working through those, that was probably the biggest blocker for me is feeling angry and then having that moment of like, okay, this is silly. I don't need to be angry. And then kind of like being like, well, but it feels weird to just stop being angry. Like, (laughs) let me, let me kindle this back up a little bit so that I can let it taper off naturally. And Uh, you know, like that's just a weird way of, um, that's just a weird way of working, but it was really cool to me to see this quote. So again, book three, uh, in section 29, Mm -hmm. we obey our first impulse. And then although we may prove to have been excited about mere trifles, there it is, you know, realizing that we don't need to be angry yet. We continue to be angry lest we should seem to have begun to be angry without cause. And most unjust of all, the injustice of our anger makes us persist in it all the more for we nurse it and inflame it as though to be violently angry proved our anger to be just. So like Mm. he's saying, you know, we rekindle that anger to kind of justify the initial anger and not have that, that just that like, uh, yeah, just discomfort of like, well, if I can just get my anger away like that, like why was I angry in the first place? That feels weird. Yeah, it's it's almost like um yeah, it's it's a rationalization. It's like kind of you know, say something makes you really angry and then somebody explains to you like, "Oh, actually that's not how that person meant it." Or like, "You're actually you actually are not interpreting it correctly." We kind of have to be like, "Well, he shouldn't have said it anyway." Like we kind of have to kind right. of create some narrative to to justify where that anger um that initial kind of explosion of anger came from yeah i like that um you know he he spends a good time good deal of time talking about trying to nip nip anger in the bud because he he has this this seneca this is has this idea that well if we let a little bit of anger in a little bit can quickly you know it's kind of like a fire you you Mm -hmm. you light a match and you know before you know it you have a whole forest fire so he sees kind of nipping nipping that initial bit of anger in the bud. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. I, I was curious how you read some of this because some of how I read him, 
seemed to me like a very healthy way to to deal with anger about a kind of this mindfulness practice, kind of noticing, okay, am I creating a story here? Um, you know, kind of being more clear with my thinking. Um, but I guess maybe one of the dangers of this approach is repressing the emotion mm-hmm. of of anger and kind of, you know, pushing it down and just like letting it build and fester. And, you know, that can obviously have a lot of negative side effects too. You know, you can develop all kinds of weird like psychosomatic chronic pain issues, for instance. Um, or, you know, you might push it down, push it down, and then, you know, when you get home, just take it out on your dog and like kick your dog because you had repressed this anger earlier in the day. Um, so I think it's good to maybe talk about, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I don't think he's talking about repressing it, but there were a few lines in there that where repression kind of was the word that came to mind. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I don't think he was taking care to guard against that interpretation. Mm. I, I think you're right. I, I read it similarly. Like there's there's one point where he says, you know, it's virtuous to if you feel the anger, don't show it on the outside. Like, yeah, like. I forget the exact words he uses, probably, again, something flowery. But um, basically the idea of if you have to feel anger, don't show it. Like you are are a better person for not having any of the features of anger, like, you know, permeate to the outside. And somebody could read that as, okay, so I just just bury it. I just uh, just suppress it down and I don't let anybody show and... But what do you think he is, is, is he, he is saying more of kind of like, okay, allow yourself to kind of, I guess the, the mindfulness approach would be, um, you know, what is it? Watch it come, watch it stay, watch it go with any, any of these emotions so that you're not, you're not actively trying to do anything. You're just not, um, you're just sitting with it and observing it. But yeah, um, sorry to, to cut you off. We should no, no. no. Uh, I, I think at some point we should kind of um, we're we're spending a lot of time in the the area that is in his book three. We should um, go back to some of yeah. the other stuff because I think that's <laughs> cool. But before we do, I yeah, I want to round out this part. So um, a couple of things. I think the strategy, as far as I can tell, uh, that he is prescribing sort of has two parts in this vein. On the one hand. He he specifically says that like the things that anger like makes you want to do aren't unjust just because anger is the thing that's that's bringing them up. Right. Mm -hmm. Because you could get to the same place by by way of reason. The difference is when you're angry, you have no way of judging whether you could also justify them reasonably. So, uh, he gives a couple of stories in the end of like people who punish their slaves and like who kill their house guests and like all sorts of crazy, some brutal insane Roman stories. Stuff. Yeah. I was reading um, some of those stories and I was just like, Oh my God, I cannot yeah. imagine living back then. So, but the, there was one and I can't remember which it is cause they all kind of, uh, at some point blend together, but there was one where essentially, um, you know, a guy was about to beat his slave for something and somebody walks in and is like, what are you doing? And all of a sudden he realizes, wait a minute, I'm angry. Let me hold off on this because like if I beat my slave right now, like I'm going to beat him too much ba- for what he deserves. And like, obviously this yeah. is not a question. It was, it was Plato. Plato. Oh yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the idea there being, it's not even necessarily that the person who is about to be punished does or doesn't deserve the punishment. It's purely the fact that when you're angry, you, you can't judge that properly. And so you should defer that judgment either to a later time or another person, but you know, wait until anger is not the impetus to act. And so I think in that sense, that's one outlet for the, the, uh, repression valve, um, or the repression chamber. Um, one way out is to defer the actions and defer the judgment for non angry time, which can help it dissipate. The other is to pursue the root causes, which he spends a lot of time talking about what are the root causes of anger? 
like like you said, it's you know perceived injustice and a desire to avenge that perceived injustice. But mm -hmm. what are the things we actually perceive as injustices? And if you spend time trying to figure out, is that really an injustice? Was I really wronged in some way? In what way might I be misinterpreting this? Or what in what way might I reinterpret this as, you know, feeling pity for the person who wronged me instead of hatred? Uh, that's the other valve, that, the other out, out valve that he prescribes that I think, you know, he doesn't describe it that way, but I think is the, the other, um, yeah, the other cure to that repression. Yeah. Well, and I think um, the kind of when you feel the impulse of anger kind of hitting the pause button, you know, taking 10 deep breaths or, or whatever, whatever today we would kind of say that is, that taking that initial time to just kind of time out for a minute I think allows you to do all of these other steps, you know, because if you just, when something pisses you off, you just fly off the handle, you know, you're not able to assess the situation, think like, okay, what was the true intention? Think about, okay, have I ever acted in this way before? Like, you know, all of these other kind of prescriptive steps that Seneca says, which we'll get into later, kind of some of his, um, you know, tips and tricks for uh, navigating anger. But I think all of them have to be preceded by just like hitting the pause button when you uh, feel this urge to kind of fly off the handle. So yeah, I love that story too with Plato. I think Plato even, he was like about to smack his slave and he like froze with his hand in the air, like in the smack, yeah. the smack position and just stood, yeah. stood there for like a couple hours, I think as a way of kind of embarrassing himself. Like he wanted to kind of humiliate himself because he realized that he was, you know, acting, uh, acting uh, in a rash kind of, you know, brazen way. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I really like that story too. So, yeah, we, we talked a decent amount about kind of defining what he means by anger, you know, differentiating it from just an, an impulse or an instinct um, and how it is kind of a rational process. We talked a little bit about CBT and some of these other things. Um, one of the other sections, uh, he, he spends a lot of time trying to answer this question, is anger useful? Yeah. So, yeah, maybe we can dive into that question yeah. some of his thoughts on is anger useful yeah absolutely um i've got a bunch of quotes in here from um i'm not really sure where to uh, yeah give me a second to skim through and find a mm -hmm. section that would be useful no problem no problem unless unless you've got something ready to go well i don't yeah i don't have a quote but i i kind of looked at them in terms of um yeah, kind of the some of the points he's making. So one of the the kind of th things that it's centered around is uh, there's a quote by Aristotle where Aristotle is saying that anger can be useful in a fight, in that mm. it can mm -hmm. be used to kind of fuel the person who is doing the fighting. Um, and Seneca says no says. No, anger is a vice, and like all vices, they are detrimental to our to the virtue. The virtue in this this case being reason, and that kind of like we were saying earlier. Like even if you just implement a little bit of anger, like okay, I'm just gonna, you know, get a little bit of pissed off at this guy just to kind of rouse me up so I'm ready to fight him. Like that anger can quickly again, build and build before you know it, you have a forest fire and, you know, your reason is gone out the window and you're just kind of overtaken by this emotion. So, um, so Seneca says, no, anger is not only not useful for fighting, it actually gets in the way. And mm -hmm. I thought this was interesting because I've heard a lot of um, kind of like martial artists nowadays and police officers as well kind of saying the same thing that if you are a skilled fighter uh you actually don't really want to be angry or feeling the this you know negative emotion when you're kind of you know doing some Br brazilian jiu-jitsu or something with somebody um yep. yeah did you, did you have some thoughts on on that yeah, idea absolutely um 
I, I think that's, I mean, I, I, this resonates with me a lot. I, I totally agree. Um, one of the sections, book one, 11, uh, in war attacks ought to be regulated and under control. Uh, anger therefore is not useful even in wars or battles for it is prone to rashness and while trying to bring others into danger does not guard itself against danger. The most trustworthy virtue is that which long and carefully considers itself, controls itself, and slowly and deliberately brings itself to the front. Um, and yeah, there, so I think the, the way that I approach this point in general is, you know, for anybody to make the argument that anger is useful in some way kind of has to posit that it's the best way to get there. So Mm -hmm. I I think there, there are multiple levels to this, right? Where like, it's not even that every act, I've kind of said this before a little bit too. It's not even that every act you do while angry is wrong just because you're doing it from anger. But the problem is you don't have a way to tell anger justifies itself like anger kind of replaces the space that reason would uh would occupy in your your cognitive space and replaces your ability to use reason to make judgments and simply because of that that's that makes it not the best way to do things so um and he also equates this to like if somebody's shipwrecked and is benefited by the shipwreck, like, you know, say they find some crazy treasure or what, like whatever the case may be, or they're, um, they're slightly poisoned and because of the poison, they actually grow stronger or, uh, they fall and by falling, they, you know, whatever, an arrow doesn't hit their head. Like you can think of all these scenarios where yeah. something happens to someone and it benefits them. Doesn't make those things good. Like that doesn't make a shipwreck sure. good. Uh, just because it, it benefited you in that scenario. And I think anger falls under that, that similar category of, yeah, if you got into a fight or went into battle and your anger drove you to do something heroic or do something that saved the day, like that, that doesn't actually mean that anger is the virtuous, um, thing in that scenario, uh, it it's not even necessarily the best way to get there. Um, yeah, sure. So, yeah. And I think, I think you, you did a good job of kind of laying out Seneca's argument. I want to maybe push back on it a little bit with a few, yeah. maybe counter examples. So, okay. So yeah, he's saying, you know, if, if we're talking about, we'll just use like a fist fight example. You mm-hmm. got person a, who is kind of calm and collected and able to use his reason, uh, saying, assuming that person, you know, knows how to fight, they're probably going to beat the really pissed off person who's just like flailing at them. Mm -hmm. Um, but not always, I guess, you know, I I think of like the scene from a Christmas story where Ralphie gets hit with a snowball and then just like in a blind rage, just like beats the shit out of the, the bully that is twice his size. I think there probably is instances of that um, where anger in that instance maybe is the determining factor where it is kind of helping the person win the fight. And maybe another example I, I would think of, I saw the, um, the Michael Jordan documentary and Michael Jordan, one of the things that he would do to kind of get him, himself fired up is he would he would kind of like get himself pissed off at one of the players on the other team like he knew that he was going to be playing against you know the the Knicks in the next game and he would remember something the other player said to to him and he would just dwell on that and dwell on that and then he would you know score like 50 points in a game or sometimes i think he even said he would like make up that they said shit about him like just in order to like have that kind of fire him up and at least Michael Jordan like he saw that as being the thing that gave him the edge in the competition that if he was just kind of having an okay game he would then kind of make up one of these stories that like oh like 
you know, the the guy on the other team trash talked me last month. So now I'm just gonna like make him pay and kind of fuel that anger. So I don't know. What would you say to those those yeah. examples? So I think uh, I, I would have more questions, I guess, about the specific scenario. So on with the Michael Jordan example, I would want to know, is he actually angry? Like, let's say the player he was fantasizing angrily about, yeah. um, like, passed him in the hallway a couple of days before the game. Or, or they were like, you know, they saw each other across the restaurant or whatever. Like, would he go up and start a fight with him because he's mm. angry at him. Cause if, if so, in that case, I would say that's probably not a virtuous way to ramp yourself up to win a game. Like that's not worth it because that kind of, even though you're, you're putting yourself in a position where you're going to win the game, you're making yourself a bad person for doing that. Right. You, you're manufacturing an emotion and a desire to inflict harm upon someone who doesn't deserve it. And you are impeding your own judgment as to how, uh, as to whether or not they actually deserve those things. Like you're deliberately manufacturing that emotion. If it isn't that kind of anger, if it's sort of a, the, the like facade of anger, well then we're talking about something different. Like that's just ramping yourself up for a game. Like if he were, if he was able to like see that person across, across the bar and be like, Hey, what's up, man? Like I, you know, How's it going? Have have a conversation. Like, yeah, that's not real anger, and that's okay. Uh, you know, and it might there might be other things to talk about there, but in this context, that's okay. Yeah, it is an interesting question of of whether he's kind of fabricating that f- for the game, and then after the game, it's like, oh, good game, man, and then they go out for a beer. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, it, at least in that documentary, there seemed to be like some. I mean, him and one of the other guys they were interview like still don't speak to each other and have a pretty bitter uh, dislike of, of one another and like wouldn't slap each other's hand after the game. So, yeah, yeah it I seems not worth it. Well, yeah, and well, you, what I think you did is you kind of drew a distinction between um, utility and maybe virtue. So it's interesting because I think Seneca here a lot of times is maybe linking some of those things. Where somebody might look at it and say, okay, yeah, it's not virtuous, but there is utility to it. So if Michael Jordan is, you know, maybe somebody who's like, you know, I don't really care about this whole virtue thing, but I just want to, you know, win my fifth championship. Uh, I'm going to use the best tools at hand. Maybe in that case, there there is a case for anger. Anger uh, from just a utility standpoint might be beneficial but i think if i heard you correctly the the point you're saying is yeah it it might help you win the game but uh it is not a virtuous thing because um you know the 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 reasons you listed as well yeah and you have to keep in mind here that stoicism is a is a set of virtue ethics right so something like being the best basketball player in the world or being rich or having a good um you know having fame having people like you like those things are not considered uh, goods. They were by the Stoics. They they called them preferred indifference, mm. meaning you are not a better or worse person at the end of the day when everything is taken into account at the end of your life. Like whether or not you achieved Michael Jordan level of skill and fame and fortune, that doesn't make you a better or worse person. What makes you a better or worse person is on the virtue side of things. Did you act? Uh, you know, wisely, courageously, uh, justly, and in moderation. Those are the four stoic virtues. And essentially anything outside of that isn't worth violating those virtues for. And that's the stoic ethic. Um, I, I think I, at least cognitively, philosophically, adhere pretty hard to that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, obviously I'm human. I, I don't always stick to that and in the moment and those are things that i do my best to correct but uh, you know i think in that scenario the the utility toward a preferred indifferent however much utility there may there may be isn't worth violating those virtues for absolutely well that's i mean i think it's important to to draw that distinction as well because that was one of the things reading this that was 
may be a little bit unclear because he spends a lot of time trying to answer the question, is anger useful? And it, it matters what we mean by useful. If we're just yeah. talking purely from utility standpoint, then I don't know. I personally think there's, there's, uh, there, there are, are reasons that anger is useful, but I think Seneca maybe talks a little bit about the utility, but he's also attacking anger from a virtue standpoint and saying it's not yeah. virtuous. It might, it might be useful, but it's, it's, but we know it's from his standpoint, it's not virtuous. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's one of the things about stoicism as well is that, uh, like, you as a system of philosophy you can't plug into it any values you want because some things like that might go out the window if you actually in your measure of am i a good or bad person if you count in that things like how much money have i made do people like me um you know am i as famous as michael jordan if those things count toward being a good or bad person for you stoicism is not going to like you, you can't just plug that in and expect it to work. Right. Yeah. In your hierarchy of values, uh, being virtuous needs to be above being the best basketball player. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So any, any, uh, aspiring basketball fans listening, maybe stoicism is not the best <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> you, uh, well, we'll, maybe, we'll, I, maybe we'll do a Mac- Machiavelli and that'll resonate more with the Michael Jordan yeah. temperament. And the thing is like, they would also say, like there's no reason you should not pursue being a great basketball player or being the best basketball player as long as it doesn't compromise those virtues. Right. Right. If you can be Michael Jordan and not cross those lines into vice, then yeah, do it. Why not? Like the Stoics the, see, this is where the Stoics differ from a lot of other uh, of their sort of peer philosophy groups who would like say, you know, you need to give up all your money, give up all your possessions. Like the Stoics were like, no, go ahead, make money, like yeah. go be a member, a contributing member of society, go run a business, go run for political office. But keep in mind for what, whatever those things are, embody virtue above all of that. You don't have to throw anything away as long as it's not compromising your virtue. Totally. But as soon as it does, be willing to get rid of it. You know, like Epictetus says, like, if you have a cup, remember that it's a cup. Mm. Don't think that your goodness or badness at the end relies on whether or not you have that cup, whether it's a cup, political office, fame, a basketball career, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we, yeah, I'm glad we kind of covered that because that was maybe one of the things that was a little unclear. Yeah. Can we can we go to your bully example as well? Because oh, yeah. that was an interesting one. I had a different. Uh, line do you know what of scene I'm talking one. about? The you've seen Christmas. No. Okay, there's a scene in the Christmas story for anybody who hasn't haven't seen the movie, where Ralphie, the main character, um, he gets hit by a snowball by Scott Fargus, who is like the uh, the big bully, who's like much older and stronger, and it's just like he was already having a bad day, and it was just the thing that sends him over the edge, and he just in a blind rage just charges him and just like starts punching him like you know until he's blood bloody to a pulp um so that was the example that i give where in that instance maybe anger gave ralphie the advantage over scott fargus in that fight sure so and we could go down the same line there as the one we just did with with michael jordan but i think there's another line to pursue as well yeah What if in that moment, Ralphie just happened to have been carrying some sort of deadly weapon? Yeah. Or what if Ralphie in that moment happened to have been someone who was a highly trained martial artist who could have killed the bully? Well, and I also failed to mention he was pulled off the bully by his mom. And who knows if he would have stopped beating, beating him up, you know, until he was dead. Right. So, okay. So this is one of those things where, you know, anger ramps itself up. It, um, we, we know from uh, psychological literature that doing things like, like punching a pillow or whatever, like actually reinforces the anger response. Uh, as far as I know, I'm, I'm not a a psychologist. I'm not a scientist. Yeah, no, I've heard the same thing that a lot of the, uh, what was catharsis that, you know, like oh scream therapy or i'm gonna take a kickboxing class to get my anger out that actually there's 
Yeah, I've I've read that too. That 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 science doesn't support that. That actually helps, and if anything, it actually makes you kind of more prone to to anger and like, right. So yeah. in the case of the bully, like if let, let's just take it to its extreme, like in if it's good that the outcome of the fight was moderate, if it's good that you know the bully kind of got taught a lesson, maybe he's not going to bully him any, anymore. Right. That result is not the result of something that is under our control. It was a result of luck, right? It was mm-hmm. a result of the pure luck of how strong is Ralphie? Is he armed? Uh, is his mom going to pull him off? Is somebody going to come intervene? Yeah. Is the other kid like big enough to withstand his his punch? Like All of those things are totally outside of Ralphie's control in that moment. And because of that, when you're counting like, is this something good or bad? Is this something worth the, the, uh, like is the outcome here worth the journey to get there? I think because of those things are out of the, out of your control, uh, you have to account for all of those other scenarios where the factors outside of your control uh, might have been different in a relevant way. And I think as soon as you start to do that, you start to see like, okay, well maybe just for the sake of the fact that, we run this scenario, you know, a dozen times or, or a hundred times or whatever and roll the dice on all those other factors. Like things don't always turn out that well because yeah. of that. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. And it's, 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 you know, say his mom didn't come and pull him off and he killed the kid. Then yeah. we'd, then when we'd look at that situation, it would be like, what wrong was done to Ralphie? He got hit with a snowball. What wrong was done to the kid in return? He was killed. And we can kind of say, oh, okay, that clearly was not you know just that was not a just punishment for yeah. or for the the injustice that was done to him so yeah i i think that's i think that's a good point so yeah. that kind of gets to the next thing he, he says when we're talking about is anger useful he also says it's not useful for punishing others and we kind of yeah. we kind of have talked around this a little bit but um did you have more favorite thoughts part. on this yeah, it sounds like you got some got some Absolutely. Ideas. <laughs> this right. is this is one hundred percent my favorite topic here. Um cool. because this I mean, it gets you to the same place as I, I don't know, I am sure you're familiar with Sam Harris's free will uh discussions and argument and sort of um it gets you to the same place in terms of justice here hmm. uh as that without needing to uh unplug the, the free will illusion from people and plug in the determinist, um, anyway. So the, the person that he's talking with, um, basically says, well, if you're, if you can't get angry, like, does that mean you can't punish people? Like, isn't punishment sometimes necessary to correct things? Right. Like how, how do you deal with that? Um, and he's got, uh, in, in book one, section six in particular, uh, is amazing, but I have like a, a big long, do you mind if I read like a kind yeah, of a longer absolutely. quote? Go okay. So similarly to a physician, it's the duty of the chief administrator of the laws or the ruler of a state to correct ill disposed men. As long as he is able with words and even gentle ones that he may persuade them to do what they ought, inspire them with a love of honor and justice and cause them to hate vice and and set store upon virtue. So he's saying like for criminals, get them to not want to reoffend. Yeah. He must then pass on to severer language, still confining himself to advising and reprimanding. Last of all, he must betake himself to punishments yet still making them slight and temporary. He ought to assign extreme punishments only to extreme crimes that no one may die unless it be even to the criminal's own advantage that he should die. He will differ from the physician in one point alone. For whereas physicians render it easy to die for those whom they cannot grant the boon of life, he will drive the condemned out of life with ignominy and disgrace, not because he takes pleasure in any man's being punished. For the wise man is far from such inhuman ferocity, but that they may be a warning to all men, and that since they would not be useful when alive, the state may at any rate profit by their death. Man's nature is not, therefore, desirous of inflicting punishment. Neither, therefore, is anger in accordance with man's nature, because that is desirous of inflicting punishment. Hmm. So, 
I love this. Like specifically the fact that like the punishment should benefit the person who's being punished, yeah. even if it's death. I mm-hmm. think that's exactly how justice should work in the sense that like if someone does a wrong, the point of punishment should be to improve society by punishing the person, right? So if someone steals something, you should make them give it back and to the extent that you can deter them from doing it in the future. Yeah. So whether that's an extra penalty, whether that's putting them in jail or whatever. So you can expand that out to any set of wrongdoing, anything that might be considered crime on a societal level. And at the most extreme ends of that, the reason for, say, punishing someone with death is because those other punishments either A, don't restore the uh, the harm done in a significant enough way, mm-hmm. or actually even that is not not why you should choose the punishment of death. It's actually more that the person who did the crime has no chance at rehabilitation. They have no chance at uh, integrating into society and they have, they inflict enough harm by living that even to incarcerate them would be harmful. Um, and the other reason would be to deter others from committing the same crime as much as that deterrence actually works. So those are the only reasons that, that I see for capital punishment um, and beyond that, like, like I said, like the point of punishment is to restore any real injury that has been done to rehabilitate or to deter. And I, and that's well, it. Yeah. And I, I was kind of shocked when I read this too, cause he has a passage where he, he says something like to, to kill somebody in that instance is compassionate because they are. Uh, causing suffering not only to other people but to themselves. So it's an interesting because he's kind of making the argument here that uh, capital punishment in some cases is a form of, um, I guess, not rehabilitating because they're not coming back. But yeah, it, it's beneficial in some way. Yeah. So it's it's. Because I think most people, when we think of capital punishment, yeah, we're thinking about the kind of um, deterrence. Okay, we're going to kill this person, make an example out of them so that nobody else does this crime. Or it's a kind of uh, retributive justice where it's like they did something bad, so we're going to punish them. Whereas this is kind of a third option. This is like this person did something bad, so we're going to help them out by, uh, by knocking them out, by taking them out of the equation. Which, yeah, yeah, I don't know. That that idea kind of shocked me. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, at least for me, psychologically, from studying Stoics, from, you know, my understanding of human psychology and determinism, it, like, the retributive circuit has, is off. Uh, you know, it's almost unplugged or taken out. Sure. That, that sense in me very, very rarely gets triggered well and i think seneca too because he spends a lot of time he spends a lot of time in this letter talking about all the reason why it's kind of silly to punish somebody for a wrongdoing yeah and um yeah maybe we can get into that a little bit but but did you have more here i didn't i didn't want to didn't want to cut you off uh no, I, I love that whole section. The The only thing better I could do would be to read the whole section, which I don't, I don't think we should do. <laughs> okay, yeah. Maybe we'll uh, encourage people to, to do that on their own as well. But um, but yeah, he does. So and this idea of uh, retributive justice, he, he says in, in some points that, okay, you wouldn't get mad at a child for, for kind of, I don't know, say a, a child threw up on you you know most people if if it's a baby it's like okay the baby it's a baby didn't know better he just just did it you're not it's a little infant and he kind of seneca kind of carries this one step further he says well you know there's a lot of people out there who are basically have the intellect of children or are as ignorant as children in some capacity 
So we should carry that degree of kind of compassion to them as well and say, okay, Mm -hmm. well, yeah, this guy, uh, you know, got drunk at a bar and punched me. It's like, well, I could get really pissed off or I could just be like, yeah, I mean, he's a bit of an idiot. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, so maybe we could move on to a little bit about how he talks about navigating anger. Yeah. Um, well, there's there's actually a sure. preceding point to that, which I think we're uh, we've kind of skipped over, and I think a lot of people skip over, but is worth talking about. Um, from my perspective, at least being somebody who. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I, I, as a kid had anger issues, sorry, uh, as a kid, I had anger issues. And one of the feelings that I had was I can't control this. Mm. This feels like it just comes, it takes over. And like, at that point I'm in the back seat. I'm along for the ride. And I think a lot of people, especially when they are prone to anger or in their, they're in the midst of it, feel that sense of, I can't control this. And he actually spends some time talking about, is anger actually under your control? Like what parts are, what parts are not? Is this something that's even uh, like something that you can change? Can you change it beforehand? Can you change it in the moment? Obviously, you can't change it after. Um, and then he talks about the strategies for doing it, but he first establishes like this actually is something that you can change. So I think that's, that's something worth touching on. Totally. Yeah. That, that it's definitely worth, worth mentioning in that, like he doesn't think that, and this kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier about, like he thinks it is a rational process, this, um, that it's not just an impulse. We we're not just kind of in his view, we're not just kind of animals who just, We'll just, uh, we can't control what we did. Oh, I punched that person, but like, it wasn't my fault. Like it just happened. Like in Seneca's view, we, we have a choice to act on these impulses or to not act on them. Yep. Um, which by the way, I, knowing you now, it's so hard to, to imagine you as like a angry, as an angry kid with a temper. Um, I similarly, I had quite a temper when I was a kid as well. And now both of us are pretty chill and mild out. Maybe we just like got all of our anger out early in life and then started meditating and just like took some deep breaths. Did you, have you ever, have you ever punched a wall? Um, I've never punched a wall. No. Mm. Uh, in first grade, I actually punched a classmate in the stomach (laughs) because he, he asked me about my Pez dispenser and I, for whatever reason, I, that pissed me off and I punched him <laughs> in the stomach. I, like years later at like a birthday or party or something, I apologized to him and he didn't even remember it. I think I was, <laughs> I felt remorse for, about that for years. And then I apologized and I was finally like free of this and he, he didn't even remember it. He was probably an asshole. If he didn't remember getting punched in the stomach, he, he must've, <laughs> he must've gotten punched a few times. I don't know. That's, that's funny. But yeah, I was thinking while you were talking, maybe part of that too, because he was talking about earlier, the people that are prone to anger, uh, children was on that list. Yeah. And I don't think that's any coincidence because hmm. part of the thing, part of the reason that children have temper tantrums is because they haven't kind of developed the rational faculty to, to deal with some of those very strong emotions that it is just like, no, I want to keep playing. I want to keep playing. And I don't know what to do with this emotion. So I'm just going to like scream in the middle of McDonald's and yeah. just like throw this temper tantrum. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think I think there is like, you know, at some point in our development, we start to learn how to manage those emotions. And, you know, by adulthood, hopefully most of us are are able to not have those temper tantrums or at least nearly as much over things as trivial as uh leaving the mcdonald's playpen yeah yeah the other day we we were talking about our dog liberty and um now she 
she occasionally refuses to leave the park. So she'll like be trying to drag her out of the park and she'll just sit and lay down. The other day I was like, yeah, she, she's like a kid at the mall, right? Who's <laughs> yeah. like, doesn't want to go, doesn't want to go anywhere like, and just sits. <laughs> nah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> just the, yeah, the that dead funny image. They just go dead and they're like, yep. Dead weight to carry. Cool, man. So maybe, maybe we can just spend a little bit of time wrapping up talking about how we should navigate anger. So we've kind of actually covered a lot of this just throughout the conversation. Um, but maybe I'll read a few that we haven't got to that I kind of bullet pointed here. Yep. Um, okay. For th- this is one of the things he, he says a lot of times we, we're like almost looking for reasons to be mad and that we kind of go out searching for anger. He says like, you know, anger will find us if we're just living our life. But a lot of times we kind of go out of our way to form suspicions of like, oh, you know, why did that, why did that guy look at me like he did? Maybe I'm going to make this story up. Um, And I don't know, I thought that was an interesting point in that like, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is. You can always find something to be angry about or to complain about. And so one of the things he says is just like, just stop seeking it out. Stop like looking for things to complain for. Cause it doesn't matter who you are. You know, you could have a really kind of shitty life and find plenty of things to be, to complain about and be angry about. Or you could have an amazing life. Like you're still going to have an abundance of things. And I think Mm -hmm. the opposite side of that, he talks a little bit about gratitude. The opposite side is gratitude in that, like it doesn't matter who you are or where you're at. You you can always find things to be grateful for. So a lot of it is just like choosing to direct your attention towards like the things that are going well or the things that you're grateful for versus choosing to direct your attention to like all the things that, um, are, you know, pissing you off. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's always easier said than done, especially if anger is a habit. But I think that you can, you can replace that habit and the, the time to do it is not in the moment. The time to do it is to, to prepare beforehand. Um, he talks about, uh, he, he says, this is book three, uh, Section 36, it was the custom of Sextius when the day was over and he had betaken himself to rest to inquire of his spirit, what bad habit of yours have you cured today? What vice have you checked? Mm. In what respect are you better? Anger will cease and become more gentle if it knows that every day it will have to appear before the judgment seat. So, and I love that. And I've actually heard that before. Um, I talked to Massimo Piliucci, uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's a modern stoic of sorts. Uh, and one of the practices that he said he does is the sort of nightly journal of, okay, what did I do today? That was, you know, that was bad. What, what kind of like, you know, like it says there, what kind of bad habits, um, uh, what vices did I do today? What did I do wrong that need to be checked? What did I do right and what remains to be done? Mm. And that's sort of his nightly journal routine. And I, I like that. I, that's a that's a good strategy, especially when we're talking about anger, to if you know that's a habit and you know that at the end of the day, when you were angry about something, you gotta write it down in there. Sure. Like, yeah. You don't you don't get to omit it because you're embarrassed. You gotta write it down in there. Maybe you'll check yourself in the moment and go, ah, do I really wanna admit this to myself later? Right. Yeah. No, I I think that's, that's great. Like, yeah, actually tracking, keeping track of when these things happen. Like, um, I'm seeing a nutritionist right now. And one of the things she's having me do is, uh, write down everything I eat. (laughs) And just by doing that, it's like, yeah, I eat a lot healthier because I don't feel like, you know, writing all the crap that I'm eating down every night. Cause then you, yeah, you have to look at it. You can't just kind of forget that you ate that candy bar or whatever. Yeah, forget that you flew off the handle and, you know, flipped somebody <laughs> off in traffic. 
<laughs> yeah, right. Um, cool. Maybe yeah. yet. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say there are a bunch of other strategies in here. Um, he talks about delay as well. The greatest remedy for anger is delay. Mm-hmm. Beg anger to grant you this at, at the first, not in order that it may pardon the offense, but that it may form a right judgment about it. If it delays, it will come to an end. Do not attempt to quell it all at once, for its first impulses are fierce. By plucking away its parts, we shall remove the whole. Yeah. Yeah, and that was kind of the the story we were talking about earlier with Plato about to smack his slave and he stopped himself. The other story I really liked was um, Socrates. He said they said Socrates when he was really mad, he would just like talk in this really slow, low voice to kind of like quench his anger. Um, yeah, which yeah, I I have definitely you know that's that's kind of one thing you hear sometimes from your parents growing up is that kind of like instead of getting ramped up they almost go in the opposite direction and they're like zach okay i'm gonna tell you one more time and like what they're really saying is like i'm about to lose my shit but i'm deciding to like actively not do that so i need you to stop I don't know. I, so I think that is that is a strategy of uh, of yeah of dealing with anger. I, I guess it's better to talk in that hushed voice than to you know be screaming. Yeah, and that that gives it a chance to dissipate if it's going to dissipate, and it also it prevents it from ramping itself up. Um, yeah, there was another one. Um, Yeah, this is pretty basic, but I think it's a good uh, one that we kind of overlook, which is just like consider all the good or nice things that that person has done for you. Um, so yeah, if you're like pissed off at your, yeah, you're pissed off at your spouse for forgetting your birthday, um, you know, it's easy to kind of dwell there. But if you just kind of think about, all right, well, yeah, but they have been super loving and they've been super awesome, like the other 364 days out of the year, like maybe I can ease up my anger on them a little bit. Yeah. 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 So nothing, nothing crazy there, but it's a, it's a good thing to remember. Um, also he says, be slow to believe what you hear. Yeah. He mentions, uh, like gossip like that a couple of times or like rumors of, things he mentions that in a couple of places yeah um which kind of ties in with the the act of pausing as well like when you mm-hmm. hear something maybe something that somebody said about you instead of just you know blindly jumping into to j- jumping to a conclusion you can kind of say like well maybe they didn't mean it or maybe this is out of context or you know, maybe the person who's telling me this is lying and has some ulterior motive. Like there could be a lot of things. There could be a lot more that to, to the story. Yeah. And he, he also says, if you know, it's going to piss you off. Like don't go looking for things that other people said about you. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't go asking about it, you know, <laughs> right? like, of course, <laughs> which is difficult. You know, if you think someone has said something about you, of course you want to know what it is. But at the same time, like, is that really the mm. wisest way to handle that? Totally. There's a there's a song by this R and B artist I like. It's called um, "I Don't Want to Look Through Your Phone," and it's mm. about his his girlfriend. He's like, "If you're cheating on me, like I don't want to know about it. Like I'm not gonna go looking for trouble. I'm not gonna go looking for text messages to like some random guys." Um, yeah, it's it's that same kind of sentiment. Like I'm not gonna poke my head around like looking for gossip about me um let's see what else the the one we i touched on this a little bit earlier but kind of ignore it and um he used this analogy of of being like a a bigger animal who just kind of walks by when smaller animals are barking at them Mm -hmm. um which i think is a good uh a good metaphor or analogy for this, that idea to just see yourself as like, all right, like I'm the big dog 
walking through and like this little shih tzu over here that's barking its head off and saying these like mean things about me like i'm just gonna keep walking yeah. um and that's i don't know like i've i used to walk some shih tzus and like little shih tzus and they would they would yap 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 and bark at these big dogs and the big dogs like wouldn't even look at them yeah because it just like wasn't worth it just like yeah. you're not even worth my time um <laughs> so yeah that's one of the things seneca talks about here is just like yeah the bigger person is just like i don't even you're not even worth dealing with you're not even worth a response yeah well cool man well chase this was awesome and uh yeah. i appreciate i know you you just got your vaccine so you're probably still feeling the effects of that so i appreciate you uh being being stoic about <laughs> coming on the podcast anyways yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely um i'm happy to do it thanks for listening to unpacking ideas if you enjoyed the show please share it with a friend or scroll down and write a review or give us a five-star rating all that helps tremendously, so thanks so much in advance. If you'd like to read along with us, please visit unpackingideas.com, where I post links to the future pieces that we'll be discussing on future podcast episodes. And finally, if you'd like to hear more from my guest Chase, head over and check out his podcast. It's called The Switch, where he interviews all kinds of interesting people about life-changing experiences they've had and how it has changed the way that they think today. All right, that'll do it. We'll see you guys next episode.